So many people today are caught up in the rat race. You know, I, I'm astounded when I listen to many Christian business people and people that are the gurus of the success, success model and their, many of them, their mindset is you've just got to work harder than anyone else. I want to talk to you today that victory is in the rest. Victory is in the rest. And it's so important because particularly when it comes to our job and our finances, if we don't get the provision thing right, we'll never walk in our assignment. And that's why when God created Adam and Eve, he got their provision sorted out so they could fulfill their assignment. And I think that most Christians haven't got their provision, their provision worked out, so their assignment... What, would they, what they could do if money was no object is just a pipe dream. It's like we're so focused on survival and getting our bills paid that we haven't discovered there is a realm that we can live in when there is, where there is more than enough. And see, this is a big deal today because we're talking about victory and particularly today's victory is in the rest. If we don't get this right, we will never... Do what God wants us to do in this city. Our plan as a church is to impact this city, is to bring the kingdom to this city, is to see this city as a, as a model of what the kingdom could look, by, look like before Jesus returns. When Jesus returns, he's coming back for a bride that has infiltrated every sector of society. He says, sit at my right hand and I'll make all your enemies a footstool. He's coming back for a church that has restored entire cities. Yeah, yeah. Listen carefully yeah. to me. This, the church is not supposed to be like everybody else. We're not supposed to model the rat race, the, the, the mindset, the survival, dog eat dog, work harder model. That's a fallen system. And I'm here to tell you today that God is inviting his people into a place of rest, a Sabbath rest. Because as I will show you today, it's in that rest that the blessing resides and the blessing always gives you more than enough. Yeah. A double portion and overflow. Yeah. Your life should echo this. Look what God has done. Yeah. And so if you're interested today, I'm going to talk to you about victory is in the rest. Yeah. Does anyone want to live in the rest? Yeah. Yeah. I don't know about you, but it's my burning passion that there would be such an overflow, hundredfold, thousandfold, Deuteronomy 111, in my life, that the flow of God just comes and goes right through me, that I begin to minister to thousands of people, become a resource. I desperately want that in my life. And I know it's not through my intellect or working harder. I need to discover how to access the blessing like Adam did and Abraham did and Jacob yeah. and Isaac. As Dean uh, shared this morning, they, they discovered a way of living in the rest. And if you will listen today with spiritual ears and pull down the walls of preconceived ideas about how much God could bless a man or a woman, God will speak to you in a profound way. If you get what I'm saying today, it will change your life forever. I truly believe that. As Jesus said, for those that hear with ears, more will be given. And those that don't hear, even what they have will be taken away. So you can leave here with less or with more. See, it's a very dangerous place that you're in today. You can either go forward or backwards. But you can't stay the same. You are in a place filled with spiritual activity. And by default, you will either rapidly grow or rapidly go backwards. Your heart will harden. And now when God begins to speak to you, it'll be just like falling on deaf ears. It's a very dangerous place to be in. Yeah. See, if, if, unless I was hungry, I would never go to church. It's the last place I'd go. It's a dangerous place. That's what Jesus says in, Matthew, in Mark 4. Because if you don't listen with spiritual ears, you will think that you know everything about the kingdom and you know nothing. 
and you're unreachable. That's why Jesus said you either be hot or cold. But if you're lukewarm, he says, I'll spew you out of my mouth because I can't reach you anymore. Anyway, yeah. Hebrews 4.9 says, There remains then a Sabbath rest for the people of God. Who is it for? It's for you today. There remains. It hasn't gone away. God, see, whenever God establishes a principle, it remains forever. So what God did in the garden is not, well, right, cross it out, plan B. No, there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. So if it's here, I want it. Yeah. Don't you? Yeah. It stands the reason. For those watching on Facebook Live, welcome today. For those watching later on, on YouTube, there remains a rest for you as well. Amen. Amen. Amen? For anyone, I love these words, anyone, anyone, that's me, that's Andrew. Who, anyone who enters God's rest also rests from his own work. So I don't need to struggle and strive in the earth system. We've got to get out of the system of the world. Are you hearing me, church? It is a fallen, broken system. If you are looking to your boss as the source of your wealth and increase, that is the earth fallen system. Anyone who enters God's rest, rests from his own work, just as God did from his. Hebrews says that we who believed enter the rest. You've got to be a believer today. As those who believe enter the rest. So we strive, we labor. It sounds ironic, doesn't it? We labor to enter the rest. We work. Why? Because the natural pull is to go back to self-made living. So the labor is to stay in the word of God and to what God says about you and what he's done for you and what he offers you is not just something in your head that, yeah, I've heard it all before, but it lives in here. You wake up and you're thinking about it. You meditate on the word until it becomes a part of who you are. That's what we labor for, to enter into that place of union with God where we say, I believe that I am the blessed of the Lord. And the double portion is upon my life. Everywhere I go, I am highly favored and deeply blessed and called to be a blessing to the nation. That is my design. Are you getting this? That's what I labor for. Why? Because everything wants to pull me out of that place, down to Struggle Street. So mankind began life blessed in the rest. That is the way that man began. It says that Adam was born on the sixth day as the blessed Lord. Imagine waking up and the very first words you hear from God is this. And we know in the Bible that what God says first, or whenever a word is first mentioned, we know that that's the design for the word. Now, when God speaks to mankind, the very first words he says is not, hello, how's the weather? How are you feeling today? Good to see you. Hi, I'm God. None of that. The very first thing he says is he pronounces a blessing over mankind and says, you are highly blessed. Think about that. Waking up, eyeballing God, and God says, you are blessed. Do you think that's going to shape your world? Yeah. Do you think you're going to live, live a little bit different? So he woke up and he heard the blessing, be fruitful and multiply. And then God took man and placed him in the seventh day. He blessed man and he inserted man into a day into a lifestyle, the seventh day, which was a day of rest and great blessing. Genesis 2, 3, and God blessed the seventh day or the rest. The blessing exists in the realm of rest. That's where the blessing is. The blessing of the Lord, that, that unconditional overflow in your life where it's supernaturally happening, it exists and resides in the rest of God. This is not some sort of foreign idea. This is God speaking to us today how to live life. The blessing is in the rest of God. He put the blessing in the rest and he made it holy because on it he rested from all the work of creating. Now the blessing is defined as this. It is a declaration which empowers you and I to prosper. 
Did you hear that? The blessing is a declaration from God himself towards you. And he says, in that blessing, I am empowering you to highly prosper. That should make someone excited today. If I was to walk up to you and give you $100 million today, would you be excited? Yeah. Well, I've got something far greater than that because $100 million can be lost. $100 million doesn't change you. doesn't make you rich on the inside. doesn't make you wealthy and wise and creative. The blessing of the Lord cannot be lost. It, 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 it perpetuates itself. It's the command of God himself. It releases his resources into your life. It is the declaration which empowers us to prosper. And when God spoke to Adam, he said, I am empowering you today. I, as I speak my words of spirit and life, and as I speak the words of spiritual substance, and as I speak over you, you are now empowered to prosper. So when he spoke that, Adam's body would have shaken. It would have, he would have felt the cracklings of God, and he would have awoken and known, I am blessed to prosper. That's what happens when the declaration of his blessing truly begins to reside inside you. You know you are a marked man or woman and that you are highly favored. And my job today is to get inside your cranium and begin, get you to understand that God has declared over your life that you are called to prosper. Don't you dare go to sleep on me today, spiritually. Don't you dare turn off. You owe the world today to be a living representation of the blessing of God, which adds no sorrow. The blessing makes a man or woman rich and adds no toil to it. If you are striving and struggling and working your little butt off, the problem is that you haven't discovered that there is an anointing from God, a declaration of your life, that you, if you will just sit in his rest, and that's not, that's not something we do nothing. It's an active thing where by faith we get a hold of his word and begin to live in that until it becomes a reality. We labor to enter that place of rest. Man lived in the blessing. And that blessing was designed to enlarge the garden and to expand the garden all over the earth. That was the design of the blessing. It empowered him to prosper, to enlarge, to take what he had and multiply it. God is the author of the garden and abundance, just so you know. And Satan is the author of poverty, just in case you wondered. God is the garden maker. Satan is the wilderness maker. That's why we heard today God met Satan in the wilderness because that's where he traffics. In the wilderness. That's why John began his ministry in the wilderness. It was to shut off an era of curse so Jesus could come and restore us back to the garden. Where did Jesus finish his ministry? In a garden. It's right through the scripture. God restoring mankind back to a garden Eden experience. We'll see that in, in, in verses to come. Where that's God's design to bring us back to the blessing. So you and I would expand the kingdom. You cannot expand the kingdom without the blessing functioning in your world. Yeah. Church, it's time to wake up. That we're not part of a fallen system. We have to actively engage the kingdom of this world. Oh, sorry, of God. It's a kingdom of blessing and overflow. All right. The blessing flowed through Adam and then it flowed through Noah. Hey, this thing is reproducible. It didn't finish with Adam. Do you read of Noah? It says in Genesis 9.1, God blessed Noah. See, there it is. And his sons, and he said, be fruitful and multiply, replenish the earth. Imagine that. Noah steps off the ark, and what does he find? He finds an earth with no people on it. He must have thought, how are we ever going to get this place restored? You think you've got problems in your family, in your workplace, in this city. Imagine being Noah. Imagine God wiping everything else off the planet, and you step out of the boat, and God says, all the best. The devil said, there's no way. No way you're ever going to amount to anything. No way you can change anything. But Jesus said, I am the way. 
when there's no way, I'll make a way. The blessing makes a way where there is no way. And so Noah begins with nothing and the blessing took one man and his family and they began to populate the earth. Wow. This blessing is for all time. It works. See, I've heard people say, oh, you can't preach prosperity in, in third world countries. Oh, sorry. I didn't know that. Sorry. I, I didn't know the blessing can't work there. Really? You can't pre preach the blessing in the outer eastern suburbs of Melbourne, it won't work there. Really? Oh, sorry. Noah was blessed. He got off the ark with nothing. He actually landed in Croydon. <laughs> he looked around and said, can anything good happen here? And God says, I'm going to bless you and prosper you, and you'll multiply and replenish and fill the earth. Be fruitful and multiply. And Noah said, that's all I need. See, when you understand... When you understand that you are the blessed of the Lord, you will thrive and win in every circumstance. It's not about your education or your background, whether you're black, white or yellow, fat or skinny. It's nothing to do with that. It's about the man or woman who understands deep in here, I am the blessed of the Lord. Wow. Is anybody getting this? Good. What about Abraham? Well... The blessing ran out by the time he got to Abraham. God was exhausted. He says, I've had enough of this blessing thing. No, Abraham was blessed as well. See, all these men and women, their lives were pictures to us of God's deep desire to restore the blessing to mankind. They were like little forerunners, pictures. God said, I am never going to change my mind. So God moved on Abraham. Leave these people, these, these people Caught up in a world system. I'm going to speak to you about a life of blessing. So Abraham packed up and he moved. And I imagine moving to a foreign place. Nobody cared whether he lived or died. Nobody wanted to help him. He was on his own. And you think you've got problems. Imagine packing up your wife. Saying to your father-in-law, I don't know where we're going, but we're going. Oh, sure, son. Take my daughter. Off you go. You imagine the friction in that household, hey? Imagine going to a father-in-law and saying that. What a silly son-in-law. I'm going to go to some foreign place, leave security. I don't know where we're going, but God just said to go. But he did that, and the Lord blessed him. Isaiah 51, 2 says, look to Abraham. Now, you look. Remember what I did with Abraham and Sarah, your mother who gave you birth. I called him when he was but one man, and I blessed him and made him many. Can you see this? The blessing of God works to, over all people in every circumstance. And when it comes on a man or woman, they may be just one, but he will bless you and make you many. The Lord will comfort Zion, which is the church. He will look on with compassion on her ruins. He will make her deserts like Eden. And her wasteland's like the garden of the Lord. Are you getting that? Yeah. God wants to take every barren circumstance, every area where there's wilderness and barrenness in your world, in this city, and through the blessing of the Lord, he wants to transform that into the garden of, the, of Eden. What's our assignment? To make Melbourne look like the garden. Yeah. That's our assignment. Yeah. I've got a garden on the inside of me. And my job is to get that garden... To, to grow and expand into this church, into my family first, into this church, into this city. Yeah. And in that garden, Adam lived in the seventh day rest. And the blessing of the Lord worked on his behalf. Wow. That's an awesome thing. Genesis 13 verse 2 says that the blessing created such a garden in Abraham's life, that in a short time he was rich with cattle, silver, and gold. Genesis 24 1 says, The Lord had blessed Abraham in all things. Did you hear that? Yeah. In all things. See, some of us are scared to ask God for more than one thing. Do you know Jehovah Jireh literally means God the multi breasted one? Have you seen a lion with teats? Have you seen that? And it's got all these cubs fighting. You know, it can be feeding, I don't know, eight or nine or however, how many it, it can manage, however many things coming out and stick on. And I look at it and I think, that's amazing. That one animal can feed eight or nine or ten. You're getting embarrassed now. It's nature. 
Think about that. God says, I'm the moldy breast of What is he saying? I can feed you in every realm. I can feed you in relationships, business. I can feed you about your body. I can feed you in health. I, can, uh, you, so I, I want to answer all your problems. I am the answer. I am the way. You bring it all to me. Don't just pray for one thing. Oh, you can only pray for one. No, pray for everything. He, he, can, he can manage it all. And it says of Abraham that God blessed him in all things. How amazing. Now, this covenant of blessing was for all of Abraham's seed. Genesis 17, 7 says, I will establish my covenant between me and you and your seed after you. And in verse 21 of Genesis 17, God established his covenant with Isaac. And so we see the seed of Abraham, all those who put their faith in God and in the blessing that God wanted to give them, they were all blessed. Isaac, Jacob is exactly the same. The blessing worked identical in those that were the seed of Abraham. But there were some seed of Abraham who refused to believe. See, this is the thing. You gotta understand today, just because God has blessed and made the blessing available to every believer, it's not automatic. Some of the seed lived as slaves for 400 years because they refused to believe and enter the rest. God was frustrated with the children of Israel. He says, Their hearts are hard, they don't know my ways. I want them to enter the rest. But they keep being sidetracked. Their hearts don't trust me fully. They put more faith in their job, more faith in their ability than they do in me. More faith in the TV than getting the loan and letting that word of God penetrate their heart. We have, by and large, an illiterate body of Christ who refuse to meditate on the word and they wonder why they're not in the rest. But I don't believe in blessing. Well, there's a reason. There's a reason you don't believe in the blessing. If the seed of Abraham is to share the blessings of Abraham, then the seed of Abraham must share the faith of Abraham. And he totally believed in the word of God. Joshua says, Joshua 1, that you've got to meditate in the word day and night. Did you hear that? I read my three verses for the day or the week. That'll transform me. No, you're meditating it. It's got to be like bread. It's, you, know, you know when you get hungry, after a while you get irritable and you'll push anyone out the way to get your food? It's the same with the Word of God. You've got to crave it until it gets from out there deep inside you. Mark 4, we don't have time to talk about it, But if you would nurture the Word, it will grow and grow. And that reality of being the blessed of the Lord won't be just something that you phrase like a like a like a bird that parrots it, it will come from inside you. I am the blessed of the Lord. Galatians 3, 9 says, those who are of faith are blessed with believing Abraham. Did you hear that? Not believers, not, not someone who's saved. No, those who are of faith are blessed with Abraham, the man of faith. The connection between us and what Abraham had is that we both have the same faith. We believe implicitly. When God says something, we believe it with all our hearts. When he says, call unto me and I'll answer you and I'll show you great mighty things that you don't know, we put so much faith in that that we call out to God and say, God, show me the future of the business world. Show me the future of the education world. Show me the future of my children. Open my eyes to see into the future. And we put more faith in that than we do in the financial review. And some economist that says, I think it's going to go this way. That's what it means. Those who are of faith are blessed with belief in Abraham. Verse 13 of Galatians 3 says, Christ has redeemed us from the curse. So the blessing of Abraham would come upon the Gentiles in Christ Jesus, that we would receive the promise of the Spirit, which is the spirit of sonship. Those who are of faith have received this spirit of sonship, where the Father speaks to us. And he shows us things to come. Verse 16, the promises spoken to Abraham and were sorry, were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. So everything that Abraham was promised, you are promised as his seed. These are yours, yes, and amen. Verse 29, and if you are Christ, you are Abraham's seed and an heir according to the promise. Do you get this? An heir 
receives what someone else has done. All their work you get. You get it for free. And our, our inheritance is not money. It is the very life of God. His ability is yours today. The Sabbath rest is possible because the blessing, now listen carefully, creates a double portion. This is what I want you to get, understand now. We're shifting another gear. The Sabbath rest is possible for you. What is the Sabbath rest? Where you come into a place where, where you're not struggling and striving. The Lord's Prayer. Give us this day. Very careful to say that properly. Give us this day our uh, exactly, tomorrow's bread. The Greek literally says tomorrow. Yeah. They've translated today or our day because they couldn't get their head around the Sabbath. And the prayer of Jesus is that he wants to give you today tomorrow's bread. Do we not see that in the wilderness with the manna? That they would collect on the sixth day enough for the Sabbath? And Jesus was saying, I want you to pray and understand that, that we have a Father in heaven. See, if you only have enough bread for today, you are in survival mode. You're worrying. And Jesus said, don't worry about tomorrow. Why? Why would he say that? Because he knows we're bound to worry about tomorrow if we don't have a double portion today. When you've got no money in the bank, it's not a nice place to be. You will worry about tomorrow. The Sabbath rest is possible because the blessing creates the double portion. Listen to this, Exodus 16, 29. Bear in mind, the Lord has given you the Sabbath. So listen, the Sabbath is not for God, it's for man. Did you hear that? Yeah. The Sabbath is not for God, it's for you. Bear in mind, the Lord has given you the Sabbath. That is why on the sixth day, God gives you bread for two days. Everyone is to stay where they are on the seventh day. No one's to go out. So the people rested on the seventh day. We see here that the Sabbath gives us a double portion. It's amazing. Do you know every seventh year, there was a rest. And every seven years, seven, seven years, there was a jubilee year on the 49th year that led into the 50th year where there was a rest as well. So every jubilee on the 50th year, the lamb was actually rested for two years and they didn't get food until the third year because then they'd plant in the third year and have to wait for the crop to grow. Think about that. You think about if God said to you, right, every seven years on the seventh year, you are not to work for a whole year. Most of the church would starve. Will they not? And think about it at the Sabbath, at the uh, Jubilee. If you said, right, now you're going to have to have enough money for three years. Just as well they had Centrelink back then. And so Israel said what you're thinking, Levit Leviticus 25, 20. How is that possible? You may ask. See, God's preempting what they're thinking. He's preempting what you're thinking today. How is that possible that I could live for three years and not work? How is that possible? Is that a question the church should ask? What will we eat in the seventh year if we do not plant our harvest? He says, I will send you such a blessing in the sixth year that the land will yield enough for three years. Did you get that? He's saying, on that year before the Jubilee, I'm going to pour out such a blessing that in one year you'll get three years income and you'll be able to rest for three years. It's a picture of the sixth day of creation. Adam lived in the blessing. See, Adam lived in that seventh year, which was continual overflow. He didn't just visit it for a year. He was born into it to live. Are you getting this? Yeah. It wasn't every seven years for him. He existed in the Sabbath. Every year was the Sabbath for him. Did you hear that? Yeah. Every year, not every seven God did it every seven because they were in a fallen system and they weren't redeemed. But he's saying to us, there remains a Sabbath rest for the body of Christ where we live in perpetual overflow. Somebody ought to be excited about it. 
Isaiah 61 was the very chapter that Jesus preached when he came out of the wilderness encounter with the enemy. Listen to what Jesus said. Don't turn off now. This is amazing. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Jesus is saying that. This is my ministry to the body of Christ. Listen to what he says. It's phenomenal. Because the Lord has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. Ah, yes, that's apparently Paul. Oh, please. I've I've read all the commentators on this. Blessed are the poor in the spirit, because they, they are, you know, like oh, he's talking to people that are humble and are spiritually poor. No, no. He's anointed me to preach good news to the poor. That word poor means those who live on the fringes, destitute of wealth, destitute of influence, position, and honor. And he said, "Blessed are the poor." Why? Because the blessing's coming back. Poor, you need to be no longer poor anymore. Why do the church so struggle with this concept that God wants people out of poverty? Poverty was part of the curse. Do you understand? Deuteronomy 28. Sickness, disease, and poverty. Our wounds, the wounds on Jesus' back were for our peace. Do you understand what that word peace means? Oh, no, it's not, it's not, it's not, it's not absence of, you know of your mother-in-law getting on your nerves. Peace, <laughs> peace literally is all, it, it's all, in, it's, it has such a wide range. It means prosperity, welfare, wholeness. His wounds on, it, on his back were that you would be filled, whole, prosperous, content. The curse is poverty. If you don't think it's a curse, try it for a few weeks. It's a curse. It, a curse brings worry. Poverty brings worry. I've never met a poor person that's happy. It's not nice. It's not nice to go without food. Do not be able to look after your children properly. It's a curse. There's no poverty in heaven. Well, over there, that's, that's the side where they all line up for Centrelink. And over there, that's, that's, that's heaven that didn't quite get finished. No. No, 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 it's not the Bible, it's religious nonsense. God's heart is prosperity. He preaches good news to the poor, he sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom to the captives and release from darkness for the, from the prisoners. Listen, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, which is Jubilee. Jesus said, I am your Jubilee. I'm going to give you rest. I'm going to return the blessing to my people and you will live in abundant overflow. He says, that's why I'm anointed. Anyone that comes to this church who gets a hold of this message should flow in the blessing. That's what the anointing does. I'm here to announce the day of Isaiah 61, of vengeance of our God, to comfort or avenge all those who mourn their loss. Listen to verse 3 of Isaiah 61. I'm going to provide for those who grieve. That word provide means to put back in order. It's the same word used in Genesis when it says God put man in the garden. It's actually a placing back in order. I'm going to provide for those who grieve. Those who mourn things lost, I'm going to put it back in order. Everything that's been stolen, I'm going to make right. I'm going to put your life back in order. If you're broke here today, if things have gone sour, don't get hard on yourself. Don't become discouraged. I'm going to put your life back in order, my friend. That's what Jesus said. The anointing comes to put things back in order. Who wants their life back in order? It says that's what it's there for. To bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes. That word crown of beauty should read turban. He says, I'm going to put a linen turban on your head. And these turbans were, uh, linen turbans were reserved for the rich. No one else could afford it. He says, I'm going to put that on your head instead of ashes, which they would put on their head. They would put all the ashes on their head because they were mourning their loss and their grief. He says, I'm going to change you from a pauper to a king. Beauty for ashes. That's what he means. A crown instead of covering your head in mourning. The garments of praise instead of the spirit of heaviness. We think that means praise you, Jesus. And it does. But do you know what the garments of praise really means? It means I'm going to give you a garment that makes you praiseworthy. 
I'm going to make your life praiseworthy. People will look at it and say, that is amazing. The garments of praise instead of the spirit of heaviness. Don't you want to carry that? You'll be called the mighty men or the oaks of righteousness. Righteousness is the way God designed things to be right. You will be mighty men whose lives, the mighty women whose lives show what it looks like when you do life God's way. The planting of the Lord. Ah, planting. That word literally means plantation or garden of the Lord. That he would be glorified. God's restoring the garden. Verse 7, it says, instead of your shame, listen, I'm going to give you double portion. Do you get this? That's what the Sabbath is about. The Jubilee is about a double portion. And everyone that sees them will acknowledge they are the people that God has blessed. I want that so badly for this church that when they look at you, they say they are the people that the blessing of God is on. I don't know what happens, but whatever they touch, there is an overflow, a double portion, not just enough for them, but they can minister to everyone, having a grace on their life, a sufficiency for all things, to do every good work. Whenever you see a need, you're able to meet it. Imagine living like that. Any need, you say, just leave it to me. I'll pick up the tab. I'll pay the bill. I'll fix it up. I'll, I'll make that right. I'll pay off that mortgage. I'll do this. I'll, do, I'll be the answer. Yeah. And they will say, they are the blessed of the Lord. How does the world see the blessing of the Lord upon us? The blessing of the Lord makes us rich and adds no toil. If you're working your butt off, if you're, if you're frustrated and you're up to your head in bills, whatever it is, that's not the blessing. The blessing will create comfort and peace. You better care for your kids. Keep your marriage. I, I'm so over reading CEOs, their pathway to success. Well, I work, you know, 20 hours a day and after my third marriage and here's, here's my tips for success. You've got to do this. Please, my tip for success is called the Sabbath rest. There remains a rest for God's people. Do you know the prodigal son? Do you understand what that whole story is about? That's Adam. Adam's the prodigal son. He left his father's kingdom and he went and tried out the ways of the world. Toil, sweat and bondage. He came to his senses and he comes back to the father And what does the father do for him? What makes the other son so angry? It's not the robe. It's not the ring. It's not even the slippers from Ralph Lauren. Do you know what it is? It's the fatted calf. Because he'd already used up all his inheritance. And now he's getting a double portion. He's getting a double portion. He's getting, more, he's getting what he didn't deserve. He's getting a double flow. Think about it, church. Mark 6, 35. There was an enormous crowd in a remote place, and they were hungry, and they were late. These are all metaphors for hopeless. Large crowd, late, hungry. And it took half a, they'd said it'd take half a year's wage to meet their needs. See, that's the earth system. How hard do we have to work to meet a need? And Jesus said, what do you have? They brought the loaves and fishes, and Jesus blessed them. And they all ate and were satisfied. And most people, even many Christians, live in the state of the crowd, either before they were fed in need, or the crowd after they fed satisfied. How many people wanted just to be satisfied? It's a cue not to put your hand up. (laughs) Most people miss the double portion. Because as I read this story, it's the double portion that brings the rest. And Jesus commanded the disciples, what what did he say to do? Go up and pick up the fragments of all that remains. Let none be lost. Jesus was adamant that the disciples would go from just survival, just being fed, to an overflow. How many baskets were there? Twelve. It tells me that the overflow is for everyone, every disciple. Well, it's, it's for the person on my left, but you know what? I don't know if I have the anointing for increase and overflow and the double portion. 
you don't stand on 85 with a bung leg and a crook heart. And maybe I've just missed, no, 12 disciples and 11 baskets. 12 baskets. Are you getting this? It is for all who will believe. Now, the problem was the disciples didn't see the overflow. Jesus had to point out to them that you can go from just being satisfied to living in an abundant overflow. I was talking to Karen about this just the other day. Jesus said to the disciples, when you go and work for me, don't take an extra shoe, don't take more, you know, extra belt and change of underwear. And, and so many people look at that and think, well, if you serve God, you're going to go without. You're going to have to wash the same pair of underpants every day because that's what it means to serve God. That, 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 that God enjoys it when we don't have much. It's a, see, I grew up like that. I grew up where if you went into the ministry, it was a vow of poverty. The church said about the pastors, you, Lord, you keep them, uh, sorry, we'll keep them poor, you keep him humble. It was a motto. But Jesus was saying here, when you serve me, I'll take care of it. Yeah. You don't have to worry about getting it. I will look after it. Jesus points out, look at the fragments. Jesus never just sends provision for today. He always sends a double portion with it. See, let me tell you something. Wherever you are, you may just have enough for today. That's provision. For, that's a supply for today. But everywhere you go, there is a double portion attached to your supply. I can't see it. Well, I know you can't see it. The disciples couldn't see it. They fed the crowd and they were satisfied. I'm satisfied. My bills are paid. I have some food. We have a holiday every three years and occasionally I can give to the poor. I'm satisfied. Satisfied Christians are selfish Christians yeah. and blind Christians. Yeah. I don't want to be either. Jesus was there to pour, open their eyes to see that along with every case of satisfaction, sitting next to it is a case of abundant supply, the overflow, yeah. every time. Luke 6, 38 says, Give and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaking together and running over. And running over. Yeah. You hear that? And running over. That's more than enough. And running over. Holy Spirit will show you things that you will not naturally see yourself. Coin the fish's mouth. Cast the net. On the right side of the boat, cast the net in the morning. Oil in the widow's vase. He will show you things that you cannot see. That's his job. I will show you things to come. So you say, Lord, I am the blessed of the Lord today. Show me the more than enough. Show me in this, as I rest in you, open my eyes to see how I can take position and take the double portion. Show me. Open my spiritual eyes to get out of survival mode into the double portion mode. You said there were four rivers in the Garden of Eden. That means there's four sources, at least four sources of income that should be coming to me. No Christian should rely on one source of income because God's your source. And in God, he has multiple sources. He is Jehovah Jireh. He has sources from everywhere. To operate in the blessing, Holy Spirit, open my eyes to see what I can't see. And then the other thing I do is I begin to speak the word. I am the blessed of the Lord. I am the blessed of the Lord. Isaiah says, if you are willing and obedient, you'll eat the good of the land. So Lord, I am willing to be blessed. I am willing to live in that supernatural overflow. I am not willing to allow lack to take my life. I'm not willing to allow lack to rob me of all that belongs to me. I am not willing. So you actually fight spiritual so lack and poverty with the same degree you would fight sickness and disease and spiritual onslaught. You've got to be aggressive against it. And you speak the word to it and you say, lack, 
You will not have any place in my home. I release the blessing because the blessing of the Lord will make me rich and have no toil. I am the blessed of the Lord. And you nurture that seed and it will grow first the blade and the head, then the full grain of the head. And that blessing that was on Abraham that took him when he was one and made him many will be the same blessing that will manifest in your life. I know some of you may be thinking today, well, that can't work for me. And I say to you, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Not one word of his word will, not one, not, not nothing about his word will ever fail. He says, I'm not a man that I should lie, nor the son of man, man that would repent. Have I said it, and will I not make it good? Forever my word is settled in heaven. The issue is whether it's settled in your heart. The word of God has got nothing to do with your ability. It's got everything to do with his ability and your desire to keep that nestled in your heart. Abraham was persuaded. And when he was persuaded, even though nothing in the natural had changed, see, your fight is not, is not, um, is not anything about your energy. Your fight is to stay in faith when you can see nothing changing on the outside. You walk outside, the same bills come in the same mess around you and you say in spite of that I am the blessed of the Lord and that begins to grow and grow and grow the garden begins to take shape and all of a sudden what is inside you is greater in power and authority than that which is outside and when what is inside you is greater than what is on the outside the outside will succumb to what is inside you and the Bible says the kingdom of, the, of God is within me and his kingdom is an ever increasing kingdom he's his kingdom has great power and authority. All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me, he said. So that authority, when it begins to nurture on the inside, will consume like Moses' serpent consumed Pharaoh's serpent. It will swallow up lack and swallow up doubt, swallow up everything that defies you in Jesus' name. So the rest is in the Sabbath. And in the Sabbath, we find access to a double portion blessing that is so supernatural, it will be like Isaac. It will turn the wasteland into a garden of Eden. It will transform your street, transform your workplace, because that's what the blessing does. So we strive with all our energy to enter into the rest, where we say no to everything that defies us in the natural. And we say yes to him. That's what the battle's for, is to remain persuaded that I am the blessed of the Lord. Amen? Okay. I've released spiritual faith and power today in what I've presented. And it's gone out there. I can feel it. And your job is to take hold of it and say, I'll make that mine. What that man said I'll make mine. If you're listening on YouTube, live stream, you say these words, what he said is mine. I'll have what he said. I'll make it mine. I'll take those seeds and I'll plant them in my garden. Seeds of life and blessing and favor and prosperity, increase, have gone out today. And you just capture them in the spirit and you place them in your heart. Mark 4 is about capturing seeds in the spirit and placing them in your heart and guarding them until they become your own tree. So I do that today, Lord. I capture the seeds of blessing and increase and I make them mine. We declare as a church that we live in the rest because your blessing is in the rest. We will not strive and struggle. We will remain deeply rooted in the reality of your promises. And I just release today, Lord, over your people great faith in your blessing and desire to prosper them. Increase them, Lord. Prosper them. Change their hearts to see what you see. Encounter them, Holy Ghost, with strategies and ideas and insight into where the double portion lies. Cause them to capture that, Lord, things that are hidden for them. Open their eyes to see. And even right now, for whoever wants this, there is an anointing here to grab a hold of by faith that would cause you to capture. I see now riches and wealth and creative ideas that can be captured in the spirit by faith and made yours today. 
We can lean into that because there is a realm in the mind of God because he knows all things where we can capture things hidden. He says the wealth of the wicked is laid up for the just. And he wants us to capture those ideas to be positioned in places where the right moments lead to the right opportunities and the right outcome. Not a day late, not left behind, but I release that now, Lord, in the spirit that your people will grab a hold of that. They would hear your words. They would activate, Lord, principles of the kingdom. Position them for influence and increase in Jesus' name.